Before we get started, we'd like to thank Merchants Bonding Company for sponsoring this episode of Let's Get Surety. Merchants Bonding Company is the largest surety-focused company in the United States. If you want a common-sense surety approach, ease of doing business, and a first-class experience, see what Merchants Surety experts can do for you. To learn more, go to MerchantsBonding.com. Now, on to our show. You're listening to Let's Get Surety. Let me hear your bonding talk with Kat Shamapande. Hey, everyone. It's Kat Shamapande. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Let's Get Surety. I have with me today as co-host Mark McCallum, CEO of NESBP. Hey, Mark. Thanks for being on. Absolutely. Hi, Kat. Thanks for having me back. It's always good to be on with you, Mark. I'm excited about our topic today. Uh, Surety is such a relationship-based business, and a part of that relationship can be the sales relationship. So to talk to us today about selling and how it can be a game of confidence, we have Ryan Estes. He's a globally recognized sales and leadership expert, author, keynote speaker, and co-founder of Impact 11, a hyper-growth startup community of thought leaders. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for being on. Hey, Kat. Hey, Mark. It's great. Great to be with you today. Well, before we dive into talking more about sales, Ryan, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and kind of how you found yourself where you are today? Sure. Well, well, my background is sales. Uh, I, I think it's the greatest profession in the world. It's the greatest way to make a living, and I've been doing it my entire, my entire professional life. So I, I started in advertising communications. It was an entry-level sales job, and um, I struggled in the beginning, but then I got on the right track and, and had some success, and of course... Uh, in a large organization, when you have some success, the natural inclination is to move up into management. And so uh, the last five years I was in that business and industry, I was the chief revenue officer of a division of a Fortune 500 company. And then uh, and then I, I made my exit into entrepreneurship. And uh, so I, I left that industry to start my own uh, consulting practice in, in 2009, uh, which was an interesting time in the world and an interesting pivot. Um but it worked out, and I, I never looked back. And um, you know, I, I think oftentimes, and we could talk a little bit about this too. Uh, change and challenge actually are the catalyst for opportunity. And uh, and then of course, you know, the, the COVID was was the next uh, big world event, and, um, and and that also was an opportunity. Um, of course, speaking went away, uh, which I do quite a bit of, and. And it was in that moment of pause and consideration, I, I thought, OK, how do I want to spend the next you know, 10, 15 years? And that was really the genesis for uh, in, investing and rebranding the company that we know as Impact 11 today. Um, so I, I'm a writer, a, a speaker. I'll do about 70 live keynote presentations a year. And then and I'm also very active as a founding partner uh, in the community business Impact 11. Wow. And I understand you've got you've worked with a lot of companies that are familiar in our industry, like Liberty Mutual, um, State Farm Insurance, and some other providers in that space. Yeah, insurance and financial services uh, is my largest category of of business. So, um, and we have a huge client roster. Uh, I mean, Mass Mutual, Prudential, New York Life, State Farm, Liberty Mutual, Mass Mutual, American Family. Um, and I think I'm just scratching the surface. So it's a, it's a big part of my portfolio of work. Um, and, and I love the industry. And, and to your point, um, you know, it's, it's heavily predicated on value-based relationships, um, which is something I talk a lot about. Well, well, Ryan, I've got a foundational question for you. <laughs> so are good salespeople, are they born or are they made? No, they're made. Uh, and and I, think, I, think, um, I think there's a misconception uh, around the vocation that it's these people that are outgoing and naturally charismatic and, and gifted with communication skills. And, and often those, those traits, particularly today don't lend itself um, to the right kind of relationships and the right kind of success. Um, you know, I, I think today it's, it's people that are curious. I'm, I'm fond of saying that, that selling is asking, not telling. It's listening, not talking. But it isn't about you. It's really about helping and serving someone else get the outcomes or the success or the results that they want. And so I think people that are very service oriented, I, I always say, you know, selling 
is it's the ultimate, you know, noble altruistic profession because it truly is an act of service. What we help people do is make better decisions in our area of expertise. And um, so to me, that's that's a skill set that can be studied, practiced. And, and I think ultimately, if you master it, you know, you can have career success for life. And that's that's actually a story that we talk about and tell in, in my new book, Prepare for Impact. So. Oh, that that's great. So are there certain foundational qualities that can be developed that really kind of get to um, that connecting, that being the active listener? I mean, wh- what do you think some of those skill sets are? Yeah, so I, I think... Uh, I think one of the core skill sets, particularly today, is learning agility. You have to stay a student. The world is changing so fast. Think about this, and I think this is particularly true in an advice-based profession in your business. So for any of the listeners, the future of advice is changing because customer expectations are changing. I mean, our customers are going to change more in the next five years than they have in the previous 50, different values, different decision drivers, ways they connect and decide, different needs and expectations. And and so sellers today, they're students, they're curious, they're constantly learning, adapting, growing. Uh, I think you have to have a healthy relationship with change. You have to insert yourself. And and then at the end of the day, you, you have to be an expert. So, you know, You have to immerse yourself in the category, in the products, in the services, in the solutions. You have to be cutting edge with the trends. Um, You know, one of the things I talk about about financial services, you you actually want to be a linchpin in your client's life. You know, you you want to have a seat at the table. The idea of being a trusted advisor, it's bigger than financial services because the implications of financial services are broader in terms of quality of life. And so, you know, somebody said it to me, say the the real key in the industry is that you want to shift from financial advice to life advice. And when you're doing that master level life coaching and your client relies on you for that expertise, you are really providing value. And value is the name of the game. It's what it's all about. So I think those are a few of the things that, today's elite sellers possess that differentiate them. Wow. So it sounds like then, you know, not only being that active listener, uh, being an able learner, but you have to build that kind of trust, I would imagine, as well and be and gain the confidence of having that trust. Is that true? That that's that's absolutely true. Um, you know, tr- trust is the the foundation uh, of a good sales relationship. And, and you know, when you think about trust, th- there are really, there are really two kinds of trust that I, that I think are critical. There's, there's cognitive trust, which is trust from the head, right? It's intellectual and it's driven by factors like product performance and service experience and research and trends. And, th- and that's really important. But the other kind of trust is effective trust, and that's trust driven from emotional connection. And it's driven by factors like empathy, understanding, perceived similarity. Uh, 94% of a purchasing decision is unconscious. And so the ability to, yes, have cognitive trust, be an expert, but to make this meaningful connection you know, to, ha- to, to develop effective trust. And, it, and it's probably no surprise, um, effective, dr- effective trust is actually the larger driver of business success and sales results. And so, you, you know, it's, that's, that really is the foundation. And the, the best sellers are able to develop both. Wow. So in, in your experience, I mean, would you mind sharing maybe a, an example of, of, of how you could convey that, how you developed it and then conveyed it into a successful situation? Yeah, you know, I, I, th- I, think, it's, I think it's preparation is a, a big part of it. So I, I'm a real big fan of, you know, doing your homework and doing your, your research. I'll give you an example. So we were uh, we were calling on Tiffany and Company, the jewelry store, the retailer, yep. and uh, they they had communicated some needs, put a piece of business out out for bid. They were evaluating a couple of vendors, 
And, and in a process like that, you know, it would be fairly standard to come into that sales conversation and talk about your background, your expertise, how you would approach the project, and maybe give a case study or do an example of somebody else in a similar situation. We actually took that, a, I took that a step further. I, I decided that I was going to fly to their high, highest revenue generating store in Dallas, Texas. And I was going to walk into that store with a photographer. And I was going to tell the people at that counter that I was going getting engaged. And I wanted to go through the Tiffany's experience and potentially buy a diamond. And I mapped that entire experience with photography and videography into a presentation to talk about my point of view on the opportunity that Tiffany's had as a retailer to turn transactions into relationships and deepen emotional connections with their customers in an entirely new way going forward to this next generation uh, of, of brides and grooms. That, that level of customization and personalization and investment into a customer immediately elicits trust and differentiates me from anybody else in that sales conversation. Now, is that repl- can you replicate that, you know, a hundred times a year? Probably not. But, but you have to consider where are your strategic opportunities and how do you prepare in a way that meets the customer where they are? And, you know, obviously we won that piece of business or I wouldn't be telling the story uh, on your podcast. <laughs> um, but, I, but I think that that is that's a that's an example, um, you know, of, of shock and awe and surprise and delight. And, and the customer just couldn't believe that that we made that level of an investment in order in order to earn that partnership. Um, but I knew what they were trying to accomplish. I knew how important it was to them. And so I made it that important to me. And I think that's the real kind of key insight. It's not about you, right? It's your bit. It's about your ability to help the customer decide and, to, and to help them believe what you believe that you're the best person to provide the solution. Selling is all about the transfer of belief. And based on that level of investment, it was pretty clear that, you know, Tiffany's believed what I believed, that I, I wanted that project and I was willing to demonstrate it and earn it in a new way. So. When you're putting all that investment in and putting so much of yourself into a sale like that, um, and, and sometimes sometimes you get the deal and sometimes you're not going to get the deal. That's right. And that could really, with so much of it, the investment, really be a blow to your confidence. How, how do you handle that as a sales professional? Yeah. And, and so, look, I mean, you, you have, sir, first of all, you, you have to understand that, you know, that's part of this business. You know, part, part of what we've signed up for is we're going to encounter some resistance. We're going to encounter some rejection. And, and that's part of the course. And I, you know, so part of my mantra is there's no failure. There's only feedback. And so in every loss, I'm looking for what can I learn to get better next time. And so we, we audit every sales transaction. I think this is a really good thing um, for anybody that's listening to this at any level of their career. And when we look back in a, a sales engagement, we consider things like, you know, knowing what we know now, what could we do differently, right? And so in a, in a loss, there's clearly answers to that question. Knowing what we know now, what do we want to continue to replicate? What did work through that engagement? And then, you know, the, the bonus or the big question is, you know, did we earn a commitment? And if we didn't, why? And really trying to unpack that, get the feedback, understand it, you know, helps us build on both our success and our failure. And again, it goes back to the first point, learning agility. You've got to constantly testing, iterating, advancing, and evolving in, in order to move with the marketplace. But, um, you know, resilience is a big part of this profession. And, and I, I always say, you know, there's opportunity in the challenge. I think the very best sell- sellers just build thick skin. They're confident. They believe in themselves. They believe in their suite of solutions. And, and they look at it as feedback, not failure. And they iterate and get better. When you get better, nobody can take that from you. You know, and I love what you said earlier. It's not this is not an ego driven process. This is about learning about your client or potential client. And then I imagine if it's not ego driven, then you can learn from your 
your failures because they're not personalized to you. Is that true? That's ab- that's absolutely true. And I mean, Kat, you made a point. You know, you said it's it's so when you invest that much of yourself, it, it's so personal. And look, you know, I'm, in, in part of my business, I'm selling me. You, you know, as a keynote speaker. I'm, I'm saying, you know, I'm, I want to be the one that's on that stage for an hour and then they pick somebody else. That's the, but you have to decouple that. And you, you know, Mark, you made a good point. I, I'm not my job, right? This is the, that's not who I, it's a part of who I am. It's an aspect, but it doesn't define my worth or my self-esteem or my ability to, you know, get and receive love and, and be a good friend and a partner and a brother. And a, it, it doesn't. It's not who I, it's not who I am at my essence. It's what I do for a living. I want to do that well, and I want to do that great. But that decoupling, that that little bit of separation, I think I think does enable somebody to minimize the ego. And you want to remove the ego from this. You know, I said a couple of times, it's not about you. A better way maybe to think about it that's actionable is the best salespeople that are growing their humility and their confidence simultaneously. And if you're leveling up in those two areas, you know, you're doing something really, really right. The way I think about our job is we're expert, humble servants, helping our customers make the right decisions for their business and their life. And I just remind myself of that each and every day. And, you know, as as sure as we're talking over the next 12 months, I'm going to close some sales. I'm going to lose some sales and I'm going to learn a lot from the experience. And that's part of the journey. Well, well, I love that, you know, you talk about learning from that. It's almost like you're taking a scientific methodology to get to an emotional connection. And then that helps you kind of go through that and be able to repeat it over and over again uh, for ultimately your sales success. Yeah. Is that true? It's absolutely true. So two parts I'll build onto that. So I, I believe selling is art plus science. You know, there's okay. an art there's an art to meaningful human connection and effective trust. It's, you know, relatability, empathy, empathy, perceived similarity. That's some of the art of how we relate to one another and, and how we feel in the presence of one another. But sales is science also. And, and you know, I'm, I mean, we measure everything. We, we, we measure and inspect everything every piece of data through the sales funnel and through the decision cycle. And we update our dashboard weekly. So, so, you know, we have a pretty good sense of, of where we're tracking and where things stand. And I think those, those analytics are, are fundamentally important because in the absence of the science, what we find is too many salespeople spend too much time on low yield activities. And, mm-hmm. And, you know, part of my assertion with salespeople is you want to move people into a place where they're going to say yes or no. And I think too many people are comfortable holding all of these opportunities in a warm position because it feels good in a way where Mm -hmm. really, you know, managing your time and and having discipline with your time management is is so hypercritical today to success. So you want to move through those opportunities, understanding we got to get to yes or no. We have to make decisions and move forward. And I'm not for everybody and that's okay, but there's not a finite amount of opportunity in the world. So, so it is, it really is the, the discipline of sort of integrating the art, the skill and the science, the analytics and the measurement. You just mentioned the time management aspect. I feel like that's one of the the most changing pieces for everyone with the speed of change, the, the expectations that are out there now. It seems like that's an area where you probably want to seek growth and, and make sure you're up to date with uh, the timing that's wanted by your clients. Yeah, I mean, I, I think responsiveness and sense of urgency are so critically important today. Look, and it's the world it's the world we live in. And there's stress around that, by the way. Um, you know, I think there are some challenge or challenges with that. I, I read some I read a piece of research last week um, that it was approaching 70% of B2B sales professionals 
um, identify with being overwhelmed and burned out consistently. 75% reported that they feel like they have to be on call and accessible to, to their customers 24-7 or it's going to damage their relationships. And we, we could probably do a whole hour on sort of conditioning your customers and how you manage your time and organizing your day into day parts and identifying your high, highest priority activities and mapping your time and schedule to that. I mean, that's sort of our some of the coaching work that we do. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it requires discipline and efficiency and sense of urgency and responsiveness and not just from you, but from your team and, you know, from your technology. And so making those decisions and getting that right, um, it, it can be challenging, but it also can be a real competitive advantage if you do it. And I, that's something I'm real proud of at our firm. Like anybody touches us anywhere, we'll be responding within one hour. That's not me personally, but we were set up to do that. And and I think our clients really appreciate it. Wow. It, we, we've gotten through a lot, but I was curious as to what, um, how you saw the ability to anticipate as maybe a, a key driver in sales success. Yeah, look, I, I think anticipation is huge. I, I think, um, so I think there are two keys when you think about anticipation. The first is okay. cu- customer intimacy. You have to get close to your customers. It's the regular contact. It's the depth of the conversations. It's the quality of the questions. And, and something I, I can, anybody listening to this could consider, have a client advisory board. Who are the five or six customers, right, that you're talking to, that you're meeting with quarterly, that you're invested in, that they know you, you know them. The customers in the marketplace will tell you where they want you to go as a solutions provider. Listen, document, connect like that. That is invaluable. So having that kind of access and preparing for the future and getting into the heart and mind of your customer, that makes you anticipatory to the rest of the marketplace. And if you have a client advisory board and they're guiding you and consulting and giving you feedback, one, it's an awesome client retention tool, but two, it puts you in a position where you're better able to anticipate. Second thing, you've got to be conducting experiments in your business. So you look at the trends, you look at the technology, you think about your tech stack. Here's an example generative AI, right? Are, are we experimenting with artificial intelligence or aren't we? And in the advice business, you have to be there. And so anybody listening, you, you could just assess, you know, what's your level of experimentation and testing with generative AI? Are you using it as a content engineer? Have you considered it as a chat bot, integrating it into your website? We, uh, we're developing Ryan Estes GPT. So anybody <laughs> anywhere, real time, can ask AI Ryan questions and AI Ryan can respond. And and the reality is we're helping AI Ryan get more intelligent and assimilate with the content that we load. But, but I think it's, it's not inconceivable that in the near future, AI Ryan could have done this podcast and his answers may have been even better than mine, which is, (laughs) but um, imagine that level of access and availability and insight and depth of perspective available to our customers real time, anywhere in the world, 24 seven gives me an advantage, gives our customers access to knowledge and advice that they otherwise couldn't be. And it scales. So, you know, whether we launch it or not, I just need to be conducting that experiment. That's an example of an experiment. We're learning, we're iterating, we're testing, and we're on the forefront of that because we have to be there because I'm in the advice business. Wow. Uh, Yeah, I feel like we've touched on so many good topics. Uh, And you had mentioned a book uh, earlier. Could you tell us a little bit more about that book? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm really proud of it. The book, the book's called prepare for impact. Um, And the book, I wrote it with my brother, uh, Chad, who has an interesting job. Chad's the um, executive vice president of business operations for the Dallas Cowboys. So he runs the business Uh of the Dallas Cowboys, um, which is a pretty incredible brand. And and they have quite a culture and a a sales mechanism. But the the book is really two parts. Uh, The first part is sales focus. So it sort of chronicles our, our sort of beginning and the principles and practice we use practices we use to become successful salespeople really in in two different industries. And then of course, as I mentioned, you know, what happens to those people They get moved up into management. Right. And, and that is an entirely different job. And, um, 
it's, it's a job that we both had to had to figure out. And so the second half of the book um, for, for salespeople that are aspiring to get into management or for people that are running teams and leading others on this call, the second half of the book unpacks these nine tactics or principles to human centered leadership. Hmm. So, you know, how do you influence culture, build a high performing team, connect with employees in a post pandemic world that's changing so fast. That's the second half of the book. And so we really, it's, it's the tale of two worlds, but it's a sales book and a leadership book. And I think maybe most importantly, um, it's a story about an important relationship to people that care about each other, support each other, love each other. And, uh, and I think as a business book, that's part of what makes it different. Ryan, where can any listener find your book if they'd like to, to go ahead and purchase that? Yeah, where, wherever books are sold. So, you know, Amazon, <laughs> Barnes & Noble. It's, um, but there, there's, if you want to learn more about it, there, there's a website. It's prepareforimpactbook.com. And at that website, you can download a free chapter too and check it out. That's terrific. Well, Ryan, it's been great having you on with us today. I think I learned a lot about the sales process from you today. Um, I hope we can have you on again sometime soon. You've been listening to Let's Get Surety, brought to you by the National Association of Surety Bond Producers. For more information about the NASBP and its members, visit nasbp.org. Before we go, we just wanted to thank Merchants Bonding Company again for their generous support in sponsoring this episode of Let's Get Surety. Merchants Bonding Company is the largest surety-focused company in the United States. If you want a common-sense surety approach, ease of doing business, and a first-class experience, see what Merchants Surety experts can do for you. To learn more, go to MerchantsBonding.com.